my uh, my brother Greg in uh, 1970. He was kind of ahead of his time. Um, wanted to uh, get as much family history as he could, and so he started interviewing um, as many of our relatives or close relatives as he could find. And uh, so in 1970, he, uh, he interviewed my grandfather, which um, he told all these stories, and that's what um, this is uh, all based on. And then uh, Steve came along and wanted to write down the history, and, um, and he did a lot of research in addition to the, um, uh, the tape recordings. I, I wanted to play some of those recordings, but the the quality from those days it was pretty scratchy, and you had to you wouldn't be able to uh, to hear real well. Um, and then uh, Steve uh, kind of got into it, and uh, he um, he did a lot of research in the uh, newspapers and um, whatever he could find. Uh, and then one thing led to another, and. Uh, he uh, eventually wrote this uh, this book. I'm not selling books because I don't think any are even available. Um, and that's what this script is taken from. Um, Steve was supposed to be here and he couldn't make it, so he sent me the script and I'm the default guy. Um, I would like to recognize um, Antone's son, Jim, in the back last survivor of the of Anton's family. It has been said by some people that, uh, that knew that during Anton's time as sheriff, his name was the most recognized name in all of southern Utah. And um, the uh, the stories that um, that he told. I remember uh, back in the 50s there was a, a TV show called Dragnet and um, the announcer at the start of the show used to come on and he'd say, ladies and gentlemen, the stories you're about to hear are true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Well, in this case, the stories you are about to hear are true, and none of the names have been changed, <laughs> and nobody was innocent. <laughs> um, on, I'll give, get my glasses here. Got to do a lot of reading here. On the afternoon of June 2nd, 1936, Washington County Sheriff John Cottom, who was my grandmother's brother, volunteered to move a large and very heavy safe from the recorder's office to the clerk's office at the Washington County um, Courthouse. That safe is still there. You can walk through the old courthouse. He was assisted by his son Mason, J.T. Beatty, and Ralph Whipple. And uh, John Cotton was attempting to lift the safe when suddenly he straightened up, took a couple of steps backward, and fell. Um, Beatty caught him and eased him to the floor and called for a glass of water, but it was too late. He thought that, uh, that Cottom had fainted, but Cottom actually had burst a blood vessel in his brain and was dead. Informed by his wife Juanita of Cottom's death, previous sheriff Will Brooks immediately asked, who shot him? Because Cottom always carried a gun and he was daring and took a lot of risks. 21 men filed applications to serve the remainder of Cottom's elected term, 
But Antone Prince was not one of them. That's Antone there. About three weeks after Cottom's death, Antone, who was a deputy county extension agent for the federal government, returned home late from a district meeting in Beaver and was told by his wife late that the county commissioners had been trying all day to reach him. He had no idea what they wanted. He found it very mysterious that he was to come immediately to the courthouse if he got home before midnight. There he was greeted by County Commission Chairman George Lytle, who said, congratulations, Sheriff. Anton was dumbfounded and pleaded that they had the wrong man, but Lytle was persistent. We went through the applications, sifted them out. Rex Gardner mentioned your name. So we appointed you Sheriff. The job paid $90 a month which was a fairly low wage, but um, that, that low wage is what caused Will Brooks, the previous sheriff, um, to, um, to resign two years earlier. But it gave promise to uh, steady employment during the Depression. The morning after accepting the job, Anton visited County Attorney Orville Hafen who gave him a copy of the 1933 Utah Statutes, told him to learn it all by heart. Anton memorized the statutes, particularly the section referring to, quote, the duties and responsibilities of the sheriff. Fortunately, he was able to ease into the job as relatively few events um, during his first year required police action. Most of those were um, related to uh, possession of alcohol or liquor, wine, and there were the usual intoxication and drunken driving arrests, as well as the arrest of a few cattle rustlers. Um, but no case gave any indication that Anton had any particular law enforcement skills until it was suggested that he look into a crime that had occurred a year before, before he took office. On March 18, 1935, Spencer Malin, a rancher in Enterprise, most of you know where Enterprise is, um, was reported to be missing. John Cottom tried, but he could not solve the case, and Anton had never even heard of it. Asked by Enterprise City Marshal George Hunt to investigate the disappearance, <coughs> Sheriff Prince went house to house in Enterprise on November 16, 1937, to gather information. Malin was last seen on St. Patrick's Day, two and a half years earlier, in the company of Charles Bossart. So Antone visited Bossart's farm with Marshall Hunt, pretending to be a soil expert. Well, Hunt, who feared Bossart, hid on his hands and knees between the seats of the sheriff's car. Bossart became suspicious after being peppered with questions and said, what's this all about? Anton shook his finger and said, Charlie, I'm charging you with the murder in first degree and you're under arrest right now. The arrest was a bold move since there was no evidence that a crime had even been committed. And no body, the body of Spencer Maitland had never been found. Before the sheriff left with his prisoner, Hunt cautioned, you be careful, he's a very mean man, but Anton seemed to have no fear. Night was at hand, and his prisoner, uh, the sheriff and his prisoner began the return trip to St. George. After informing Bossart that he did not have to answer any questions, 
the sheriff began his interrogation. You might as well go back because I don't know anything, was Charlie's response. For about 10 miles, Anton drove along in the dark, contemplating his next move. Suddenly, he whirled at Boss Hart, pointed his finger and said, Charlie Boss Hart, as sure as there is a God in heaven, you are guilty of murder in the first degree. And I can tell you within two places where the body is. Bossart was stunned and asked incredulously, where? Either in the cedars behind your house or down in the desert in a well, the sheriff replied. Charlie was dumbfounded. Down in the desert in a well, he blurted. Anton couldn't believe his ears. You mean it, huh? It was a bluff, a ruse, a grand deception. That, that, um, but Anton had thrown out the bait, and Charlie took it, swallowed it whole. We had a fight down at the place, and George Schaefer and I had to kill him, Bossert continued. We took him down in the desert and threw him in this well. Then we sifted a lot of dirt down on him. It was late at night, and Anton had extracted a confession, but still no evidence that a crime had been committed. What if Bossert woke up the next morning and decided to recant? What if the body could not be found? The quick-thinking sheriff concocted another plan. Going to Dick's Cafe in St. George, he told proprietor Dick Hammer, to fix up the best meal he could find and throw in a couple of candy bars just to sweeten the deal. In the meantime, Anton asked Charlie if he could find the well at nighttime, perhaps fearing that in the dawn an attorney would appear and tell Bossart to keep his mouth shut. Bossart claimed that killing was not intentional, but rather in self-defense, that he and Malin had been best friends since they had known each other, and that he was very willing to lead the sheriff by moonlight to the well where the body was deposited. Armed with rope and flashlights, the group that included the sheriff, Boss Hart, City Marshal Paul Segmiller, and Claire Morrow located the well. Anton began almost immediately the arduous task of searching for the body, but the well had partially caved in and was filled with tumbleweeds. The next day, the sheriff worked with a crew that labored diligently to remove the dirt and obstructions from the 110 foot deep well. The case was sensational enough to generate headlines in many uh, newspapers across the nation. The Seattle Times and Salt Lake Tribune, among others, featured a photo of the sheriff being lowered into the well, wearing head protection of a tin kettle from his wife's kitchen, <laughs> strapped to his head. After a difficult and dangerous day of digging the 110-foot well, during which time the sheriff openly doubted Boss Hart's veracity, Spencer Malin's body finally was recovered, prompting a banner story in the Salt Lake Tribune, complete with a large mugshot of Charlie Bossard and a diagram of the abandoned well in Iron County where the body had been entombed for nearly three years. But as it turned out, there was one rather significant problem, as Antone explained. Now some of you if you're squeamish, you may want to plug your ears. I tied this rope around his legs and said, take him away. He had on a blue suit on, and when they started pulling, they pulled the right shoulder off and his head. I thought that was all that was necessary. When they started pulling him up, the juice from him came down on me in a stream. Just imagine how I felt. Well, we took him to St. George, and I went into the district attorney, and I said, Ellis, who's Ellis Pickett, 
we got this man. He looked at him and said, well, we've got to have the head. Without the head, we haven't got any corpus delecti. We need a complete body, a corpus delecti, so he can be recognized. So back to the well, it was obvious that locating the skull would be done at great risk. Under the direction of E.A. Hodges, a state mining engineer, the walls of the well were timbered. And after about five more feet of digging, all by the sheriff, since his helpers refused to go into the well, the badly crushed skull was located. Following the drama of the original arrest and search for the body in the well, the trials of Charlie Bosshart and George Schaefer seemed almost an afterthought as the prosecution failed to break down the self-defense plea and the jury came back with a verdict of not guilty. In reality, the prosecution may have only made a half-hearted attempt to assault the self-defense plea as Orville Hafen recorded in his journal at the time of the arrest. When I took Bosshart's confession Wednesday morning, I came away feeling that it would be much easier to defend him than it would be to demand his life. Predictably, Antone disagreed with the verdict. That was a slap in the face of a law enforcement officer, he said, because even though they killed him in self-defense, they took him down to the desert and threw him in a well and covered him over. That should have been the end of the story. But after, four days after the verdict was read, Anton got a call to go to Charlie Bossart's farm. Common sense dictated caution that the sheriff went alone. It was the final surprise of a strange case. When I got there, they had a big dinner prepared. I'd never seen such a dinner, chicken or turkey, dressing, salads, dressing to go with it. They said, Sheriff, you were so fair in this trial. You didn't try to do anything but be fair and just. We, we wanted to just give you a dinner for it. Well, naturally, I thought they were gonna poison me. They'd pass the mashed potatoes and I'd thank them and let them go all around the table and let everyone take some. When it came back to me, then I'd take some. <laughs> My fears were to no avail because they were just trying to show me consideration because I'd been fair with these men. Shortly thereafter, Sheriff Prince was called back to Enterprise where Boss Hart was pointing a gun at Roy Adams and threatening, if you move, I'll kill you right there. Antone, typically fearless, took the gun and told Bossart, I'll take you to jail and lock you up and you'll go forever if I have anything more like this happen. That was the last time Sheriff Prince ever had any trouble with Charlie Bossart. Unlike John Cottom, who had carried a gun at all times, Anton was unarmed as he approached Bossart. All the time you were running around without a gun, he was later asked. Oh, he said nonchalantly, I had a gun in my car, in the glove compartment to be exact, completely out of reach. That was my philosophy. I never carried a gun. Um, to add to that, I remember when um, we were, um, me and my brothers were in St. George during the summer, um, visiting, staying with my grandparents for um, a couple of weeks. We were driving around and uh, Grandpa saw a, um, a car that was off the road and pulled over to check it out. And he opened his glove box and there was his 38 pistol and he reached in and he left the pistol and he pulled out a little thing that he called a billy club which was a little I don't know there was a little iron or lead thing that was wrapped in uh, 
uh, in leather and it would conceal it in his hand. And I, I guess if you got hit in the side of the head with that, you'd know you'd been hit. And, uh, and I was amazed because, you know, I watched Hopalong Cassidy and, and I watched the Cisco Kid and I thought, you know, Sheriff, I'd be carrying a gun. In retrospect, the wonder is that Anton Prince and not John Cottam never got shot. The first opportunity for that to happen came on November 16th, 1938, a day after Jack Herman Gordon robbed G.W. Simmons of Salt Lake City, stole his car and left him tied in a gulch. Simmons worked himself loose and flagged down a Shibwitz Indian bus driver named Yellow Jacket, who alerted authorities, notified that a man matching the description of the robber had purchased a ticket for Las Vegas on the Union Pacific bus line, Anton and Deputy Sheriff G.P. Howell waited at a bus stop in front of the Big Hand Cafe in St. George. The suspect spotted the lawman, escaped through the emergency door of the bus, and ran across Main Street into an alley behind the J.C. Uh, Penny store on St. George Boulevard, where he hid among some packing boxes. Anton followed him into the alley, unarmed, and ordered him to come out with his hands up. As he flashed his light in the direction of Gordon, however, he saw a gun aimed right at him. You don't have enough guts to shoot, growled the sheriff in what became a familiar refrain. Come on out with your hands up. Next morning at breakfast, Anton mused, I can't figure out why he didn't pull the trigger. A few days later, Anton's son, Clayton and Alpine were taking a trailer full of trash down to the city dump and asked their dad for a gun in case they happened to see a rabbit. Anton gave him the gun that he had just taken from the prisoner. When they saw a rabbit, Alpine tried to pull the trigger and it wouldn't fire. And he pulled and he pulled and finally he pulled hard enough finally dawned on Anton that the reason he wasn't shot was that the mechanism jammed. It was a close encounter, but hardly the only one he ever had. Henry Ward, the sheriff of Las Vegas, called Anton one night and told him that a man who had just robbed a garage at gunpoint in Las Vegas was headed in the direction of St. George and was armed and dangerous. Sheriff Prince set up a roadblock, which in this case amounted to him standing alone in the middle of the road, <laughs> armed with a hunting rifle. At two o'clock in the morning, about seven miles west of St. George, he spotted the car. I yelled at him to stop, recalled Anton, and leveled my 30-30 at him, but he just kept coming until he got right up to me almost. He plied on his brakes, and I had to ask him to come out of the car with his hands in the air. I turned my head just a fraction of a second. I looked back, and I looked right down the mouth of his revolver. There we were, out in the desert, just the two of us, and I was looking down his gun. I just stood there. He told me that he was, what he was going to do. He was going to kill me and throw me in my own car, haul me so far that I'd never be found. I let him talk. I didn't appear to be frightened, but I was. And I finally said, you yellow son of a bitch, you haven't got enough guts to shoot. Hand me that gun. His arm dropped, and I took the gun right out of his hand, threw it out in the sand. I left his car right in the middle of the road while I brought him to St. George and locked him up. On the road, he said, I don't know why I didn't kill you. In November 1938, after filling the remainder of John Cottam's term, Anton ran for election for the first time. Following his work with Charlie Bosshart, 
in part of the Charlie Vlasok case, the returns from enterprise were predictable. Anton picked up all but 11 of the votes and nobody was quite sure why he didn't get those. He did just about as well in the rest of the county getting nearly 64% of the vote. Sheriff Anton B. Prince, Democrat, proved to be the best vote getter, said the Washington County News in reporting that he received more votes and a larger margin of victory than any other candidate in the election. There's no doubt that Sheriff Prince was widely popular, but it did not hurt that he ran as a Democrat, a cagey move at the time of Franklin D. Roosevelt's first re-election, since theretofore Anton had been a Republican. Sweeping seven candidates out of a possible 10 into office, the Democrats in Washington County definitely showed that their candidates were the people's choice at the polls Tuesday reported the Washington County News. Ironically, one of the major depression era programs of this new party was indirectly responsible for a significant portion of the crime which the sheriff had to deal. The Civilian Conservation Corps, widely known simply as the CCC, was created by a Democrat-controlled Congress in 1933 as an employment measure to provide work for young men in reforestation, road construction, prevention of soil erosion, and park and flood control projects. In southern Utah and across the border on the Arizona Strip, there were a total of 11 CCC camps one of which the remnants are still at the other end of, uh, of Leeds um, as a historical monument. More than a few, um, oh, to most of the uh, young men hailing from outside of Utah, more than a few got into some sort of trouble while well attached to the Corps causing an increase in crime in Washington County. And a former CCC boy was responsible for the only murder that Sheriff Prince knew to be committed during his jurisdiction, in his jurisdiction while he was in office. Royal Hunt, a resident of St. George, who ran a ranch um, about 28 miles north in Pine Valley Mountains near Central, met Vey Monroe Fenley, an 18-year-old ex-CCC member, on November 21, 1941, and offered him employment at the ranch. Finley, who had been dishonorably discharged from the CCC for multiple thefts, at his camp near Sacramento, worked on the ranch for two days, but on the third day, he shot his boss through a window in the ranch house with a 22 rifle and robbed him. While Finley saddled a horse with the intention of riding to Nebraska, a trip of more than a thousand miles, Hunt revived enough to telephone the operator in Central to report that he had been shot. Finley subsequently re-entered the house and shot the wounded rancher three more times, killing him. Mrs. Mahalia Bracken, the telephone operator, had already called Sheriff Prince, who hurried to Hunt's ranch with his deputy, Art Mitchell, Judge George Whitehead, and Royal Hunt's wife. He then organized a posse that searched all night for the fugitive. Early the next morning, a government trapper captured Finley, who was weakened from his night-long wanderings in severe cold weather. 
In his possession was Hunt's watch and $21.51 taken from Hunt's wallet. When taken into custody, Finley initially denied any, no any knowledge of Hunt's death, but with repeated prodding by Sheriff Prince, he finally admitted that he knew that Hunt had $15 in his possession and killed him to steal the money. Justice was swift for this young man. Apprehended on November 25th, 1941, he was arraigned on December 1st. The jury was selected on January 6th. On January 12th, after three hours of deliberation, the jury delivered a verdict of guilty and offered the choice of death by firing squad or hanging, Finley chose the firing squad, and the execution was scheduled March 10th. They didn't waste any time in those days. Before the execution, however, his sentence was um, commuted to life in prison. That is Finley, that is Sheriff Prince, and his deputy, Art Mitchell. With that, Finley was luckier than the previous three men arrested for murder in St. George, each of whom was hanged by vigilantes. One of the three, Tom Forrest, was right here in Silver Reef. He was a miner and he was fired from his job. And he was um, so upset that he returned and killed his boss. The boss was um, a popular guy, well liked by the rest of the miners. Correct me if I'm wrong, Wes, in the story. But he, um, uh, there was a group that was so irate they wanted to hang him right there. Cool heads uh, prevailed and said, no, we need to take him into St. George, put him on trial. So they hauled him into St. George, put him in jail, and um, a group of uh, irate um, miners came in and broke him out of jail. And uh, they looked around and found a, uh, a telegraph pole, threw a rope over the, the cross member, uh, and um, tried to hang him, but he was too heavy and broke that cross member. <laughs> and um, so they looked around and found a large mulberry tree. Locust tree. Okay. We used to, as kids, um, sleep under that tree. It was located between Antone Prince's house. Of course, he, Antone Prince wasn't there at the time because it, this was in 1881. Uh, and um, his father in law, George Cottom's house. And um, in the summer, it was the coolest place that we could sleep, not knowing that there might be a ghost running around. <laughs> anyway, um, there they, uh, they hung uh, Tom Forrest. <coughs> and a, uh, an onlooker was heard to say, I've watched that tree grow nigh unto 20 years, and this is the first time I've seen it bear fruit. <laughs> Sometime before the CCC was disbanded, right after, the, um, uh, or at the start of World War II, a truck carrying 26 workers was hit by a flash flood somewhere on the Arizona Strip. 
vast but sparsely populated area between the Grand Canyon and the Utah-Arizona border. All of them escaped except one. And then so uh, Anton organized a search, po uh, search posse to scour the countryside as they reached the mouth of the Virgin River Gorge where two decades later I-15 was built. All of them turned back except Anton and Jack Spencer. Hungry and thirsty, having gone without food and water all day, the two passed and pressed on and soon encountered a large rattlesnake, which crawled back between two sandstone rocks, after which Anton anchored a stick to block its escape. Late at night, choking from thirst, Anton said to Jack, I've got to go back and get a drink. As they descended a ledge in the vicinity of the rattlesnake encounter, Anton said, Jack, be careful. They say where there's one rattlesnake, there's usually two. No sooner did the words leave Anton's mouth than a rattler grabbed him on the leg, hanging on his overalls. My hell, Anton yelled. I'm bit by a rattlesnake, Jack. The snake wrapped around his leg and hung on for several seconds before he was able to shake it loose. Remarkably, the snake's fangs penetrated the pants, but not his leg. Having no flashlight and unable to see in the dark, the duo backed up against the ledge and stood there the rest of the night, afraid to move. The next morning, they carefully made their way down through the narrows, locking arms to stabilize each other against the swift current of the Virgin River. As they exited the canyon several hours later, they were met and received word that the body had been found by a dog about 10 miles downstream near Mesquite, Nevada. Antone's fear of rattlesnakes, considering that he'd had a, a very similar experience while growing up in New Harmony, was understandable. But his other great fear was irrational. He was terrified of rats and mice. <laughs> Knowing of his fright, his sons Alpine and Jim, who sits, the perpetrator is right there, <laughs> sitting in the back, found a mouse in a bathtub one day and put it alive in a paper bag. They handed the bag to Anton, who opened it, and a mouse jumped out. Anton did not appreciate the prank. I'll kill you, sons of bitches, he yelled as he chased his sons around the house. I'll kill both of you. I'm going to kill you on the spot. Remarkably, he had no such fear when he came face to face with known best desperados such as Bill Shanley. The Arizona Strip being isolated from the rest of Arizona by the Colorado River and out of reach of Utah authorities was an ideal home for polygamists seeking to live without government interference as well as for a variety of thugs, thieves, and cattle rustlers, the most notorious of whom was William Franklin Bragg who assumed the alias Bill Shanley after killing a posse, by, a, member, a posse member by that name. Uh, as an aside, down at the, um, the Dixie Center in St. George, and I haven't been there for a while, but there was a, a whole wall that had um, branding irons um, from old ranchers all over the place, one of which was the branding iron of Bill Shanley. Shanley was a 12-year-old tending cattle in a remote mountain area of southeastern Utah when he met and for nearly three weeks shared a campsite with four desperados, including Butch Cassidy. The infamous outlaw introduced him to the fine art of his trade and invited him to join the gang. Shanley declined the information or the invitation, 
but did follow in Cassidy's direction, eventually becoming, according to his biographer, in that little book right there, one of the great cattle rustlers of all time, after having escaped from the Colorado State Penitentiary, where he was serving a sentence for first degree murder. The Arizona Strip, with plenty of cows, provided a perfect venue for Shanley, who rustled and killed cattle. On May, in May 1941, Antone got a tip that Shanley was bringing across the state line, was bringing beef across the state line to cafes in St. George and arrested him, along with a, another person named Honore Cook. Cook remained in jail, but Shanley was released on a thousand dollar bond, but did not stick around for trial. But months later, Antone spied the fugitive at the Liberty Hotel in St. George, went in and tapped Shanley on the shoulder and told him he was under arrest. As always, Antone did not have a gun. But nevertheless, he said, you better hand me that thing under your arm. He said, I don't want a scene here. Sheriff, uh, Shanley looked at the sheriff, reached under his arm, and handed over his 45 Colt revolver. Shanley was given a $300 fine and six months in the county jail for, quote, slaughtering of beef without a slaughterer's stamp. The only charge that could be leveled at him in Utah since the cattle rustling took place in Arizona. At first, Antone carried two or three meals a day to the prisoner from Dick's Cafe, but after a couple of months he said, Bill, I'm not going to carry another meal for you. If you can't get your own meal, you can starve. Shanley looked at Antone and said, do you trust me? If I didn't think I could, I wouldn't do it, came the response. Time and again, Shanley went to Dick's Cafe, had his meal, and came right back. In May of 1942, Antone took him before Judge Will Hoyt, who released Shanley to do necessary planting and farming on his ranch. The sheriff tells me that you've been a model prisoner, Mr. Shanley. You told him he could go. Shanley replied, well, I'm not going. <laughs> Both the sheriff and judge tried to persuade him, but turning to Antone, Bill repeated, I'm not going. You're the only man who's ever treated me like I was a white man, and I'm going to stay. Shanley, as a matter of fact, was white, but had been raised on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona, and no man had ever treated him with the kindness and trust that the sheriff had, perhaps for good reason. After all, he was a cattle, or a cattle rustler and a convicted murderer. Shanley finally did go to his ranch with the promise to return to jail in five months to serve the remaining 60 days of his sentence. True to his word, and before the appointed date, he returned to jail, and the sheriff continued to trust many prisoners, though one time he got stung. In August 1942, Harold Messenger and Bill Shanley and a few other prisoners went to Dick's Cafe for breakfast under the charge of Deputy Sheriff Israel Wade. As they started back after breakfast, Messenger claimed that he had urgently had to go to the restroom and it was permitted by Wade to go ahead. When Wade arrived at the jail, however, Messenger was nowhere in sight. Anton found the escapee's tracks at the back of the jail and surmised that he had headed north. Driving up to the Sugarloaf, he did not see Messenger, so he drove east toward Washington. Once again, he could not locate the escapee. He returned and drove several miles up the old road that went to Enterprise. Getting out of his car, he walked over to the edge of the Black Ridge and spotted the man climbing it about a quarter of a mile away. The sheriff ran out of sight to a point where he expected the prisoner to come over the ridge. 
He was in exactly the right location when the messenger emerged and immediately took the escapee into custody. Held in solitary confinement, messenger vowed that when released, he would come back and kill the sheriff, though it proved to be an empty threat. Undeterred, Anton continued to trust many of his prisoners. At the close of World War II, Anton and his wife, Belate, invited their son Clayton and his wife, Joy, who were my parents, who were visiting St. George with their year-old son, me, to go to a dance. I'll get babysitting, said Anton, who left and soon returned with two young men. Now you take care of this boy, instructed Anton. I'll guard him with my life, Sheriff, came the response. While at the dance, Clayton and Joy asked who the babysitters were. Oh, my prisoners, <laughs> Anton answered casually. Upon returning home after the dance, Clayton, my father, recounted. We came up and saw these two guys just fussing around outside, and Dad says, well, I think it's about time for you boys to go back there. Can you go back over to the Big Hand Cafe and get your dinner and then go up and lock yourselves in? Or do you want me to do it? Prisoners responded, no, Sheriff, we can do it. And they did, Joy piped in, they did. What is now the Southern Utah University at the time was known as the BAC, or Branch Agricultural College. It was the arch rival of Dixie College. Both schools were small. So the teams played football with only six players on each side. In 1940, as the big game between the two approached, Merrill Bud Kuntz, one of the Dixie players, came up with a brilliant plan taking teammate Justin Tolton to, along to Cedar City, they carefully measured and laid out a large block D on the side of that grassy hillside. Kuntz, who was a skilled carpenter, took great pride in making the letter perfect with string line and tapes before pouring gasoline on the grass to kill it. The D between 20 and 30 feet tall, it was an overwhelming and unwelcome sight for the hometown fans the next day. Irate Cedar City official called Sheriff Prince, who investigated and quickly found the perpetrators. At the behest of BAC leaders, an assembly was arranged for Kuntz and Tolton to meet and apologize to their enemies. Can you believe this, said Kuntz? Now I've got to get up in front of the whole school. On the appointed day, Sheriff Prince picked up the culpable parties and began to drive them to the BAC and their doom. After chastising them, not more than halfway to Cedar City, right over here on the Black Ridge, Anton suddenly put his foot on the brake. Now, as I recall, what he said was, oh, hell, I can't do this. I can't take you up to apologize to those Cedar City people. And he turned back to St. George. But it was too soon to return because everybody would know that they had skipped the assembly. So Anton took them to Washington, drove them through the fields, and stopped to get a milkshake for about as long as it would have taken to go to Cedar City and back. In recounting the incidents, incident, Kuntz said that his father got a kick out of two things. First, that Sheriff Prince did not make them to apologize. And second, that through the years, many uninvolved people took credit for the prank. <laughs> Though the Bossart case got the most press, 
and the BAC prank story was repeated most frequently. The case that Anton always thought to be his most important was in his encounter with Joe Lewis, a bank robber and prison escapee, who, according to news reports, was one of the FBI's most wanted. So often did Anton repeat the story in his later years that his wife allayed upon hearing just a few words, was recorded on tape on one occasion saying, I gotta leave the room, I've heard it so many times. And then on another, she just said, oh, bull. The late's reaction would seem to indicate that Anton embellished the story each time he retold it. But his account is remarkably consistent, not only with the Washington County News, but also with the official account in the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin. On the night of September 26, 1944, Highway Patrolman Lauren Squire called Anton to report that he had been shot at twice after stopping a car for speeding. After reaching Tokerville and talking to Squire, Sheriff Prince approached the automobile and shouted, if you're in that car, you better come out with your hands in the air because you're surrounded and somebody's going to get hurt. Nothing happened. So he looked in the car and found a box in the front seat containing $364 in silver dollars three brand new guns that had never been fired, a 38 special police revolver, a 32 automatic revolver, and a 22, and well over 100 rounds of ammunition. My Uncle Jim now is in the possession of one of those guns. No, a different gun, but the... So it's got a hideout gun again. Um, anyway, uh, Antone phoned Jay Newman, chief agent for the Western District of the FBI, and reported the incident. incident. Newman heard enough and interjected, do you know who that cookie is? Antone did not, so Newman told him, Joe Lewis, the number one enemy in America today. Lewis had just robbed a bank in Prairie City, Oregon, had earlier that year had escaped from the Texas State Penitentiary. You be careful. By daylight, I'll have several agents down there to help you, Newman said. At daybreak, at daybreak Anton started tracking Lewis. In all his years of running livestock, Grandpa had uh, had a, um, before the Depression, had a, a huge herd of Angora goats and ran them over the um, east side of uh, the mountain just behind us here. And so he knew the, um, the country probably as well as anybody alive. Uh, in all his years of running livestock, he had become an expert tracker as recognized by the FBI bulletin, which said, uh, Sheriff Prince is a tireless worker who has in the past proved himself expert in the art of tracking down fugitives. Though his tracks were easily identified by the unique prints of his rubber heels, which carried the picture of a bell, numerous times Lewis's trail was um, picked up only to be lost as the outlaw traveled back and forth across the base of the um, Pine Valley Mountains. I, I think that I read that it, he went clear as far as Winchester Hills and turned around and came back um, all over the place. On the fifth day, Deputy Sheriff Carl Caldwell and two FBI agents located the tracks and came upon Lewis near a stream, which is Leeds Creek up here. Um, and um, the, the noise of the running water covered their approach, but when they were close and called for him to surrender, Lewis fired two shots and jumped into the creek. The officers returned fire, striking Lewis in the right temple. When Anton arrived on the scene a few moments later, Lewis's lifeless body was being dragged out of the water. I remember when we were kids and spending a, a couple of weeks uh, with my grandparents, we'd go out and uh, always doing something to get in trouble and we found a, um, a desk or a, a bureau or something 
uh, out in his garage and going through it, opened a drawer and here was a picture of a dead man laying on a table with a bullet hole. And when Grandpa found out that we saw that picture, he uh, made sure that we didn't do that again. Um, high praise was given by FBI agent Newman for the fine cooperation of all branches of law enforcement and the trailing ability of Sheriff Prince. The next week, Antone received a personal letter from the famous FBI director J. Edgar Hoover commending him for your tireless performance of duty, which coupled with your detailed knowledge of the terrain and your abilities as a tracker made possible a successful termination of this case. Yeah, there's the letter from J. Edgar Hoover. It's hard to read, but it um, went on to say, if, uh, if you're ever in Washington, D.C., I would appreciate that you would come and visit me so we could uh, talk more about um, your experience. Antone had two other cases involving a gun battle. Las Vegas police called to notify Antone that a garage owner there was robbed of his car and uh, robbed and his car was stolen. Once again, Antone thought a roadblock meant standing alone in the middle of the road waving his arms. He barely got out of the way as the car tried to run him over. Both Antone and City Marshal Paul Segmiller opened fire, causing the car to weave but not stop. Driving in a car with a windshield that could be pushed forward, the two lawmen gave chase, loaded up and ready for action. They spotted the car near Cedar City and followed it briefly down a dirt road. It had to stop when the dust from the suspect's car reduced visibility to near zero. Later, the FBI found the car abandoned near Wendover, Nevada. There were holes in both hind fenders, large pieces of rubber taken out of both solid rear tires, I guess they didn't have inner tubes in those days, and a bullet hole lodged in the front seat just two inches from the driver's back. The agents commended Prince and Segmiller for their marksmanship, saying, they had never seen so many well-placed shots in a car that didn't stop it. <laughs> but they chided the pair for not shooting at the men instead of just trying to stop the car. The other known case of a gun battle had an almost comical ending. The car that had been stolen in Mesquite was trailed by Antone and Deputy Sheriff Lee Adams as they raced down Tabernacle Street in St. George at a speed of 80 miles an hour. When the fugitives failed to stop at the edge of town, Antone peppered their car with bullets and, as reported in the Washington County News on 30th of September 1943, shot the tires off, forcing the car to stop. Two youths jump out and began running up a hill. By the time the officers stopped, the boys were nearly to the top of the hill. Antone yelled to them, Stop or I'll shoot your legs off. The youths who had just been on the receiving end of superior marksmanship from the window of a speeding car wisely decided not to tempt fate and were taken into custody. Antone was no nonsense in most respects, but was also compassionate and would try to settle a matter whenever possible outside of the legal system. If a juvenile was involved nowadays in some of these offenses, they'd have him in court and really make a big deal out of it, said Charlie Pickett, whose father, Ellis, was district attorney for most of the time Antone served as sheriff. Antone would get these kids that were doing some pilfering. We called it pilfering. It wasn't stealing. He'd get the kids and talk to their parents, and it never got past that. Once Antone would talk to you, you got things straightened out. One day I was a, a practicing dentist and um, a man came into my office and um, identified himself as 
Arden prints in uh, virtually uh, all of the um, people in, in the state of Utah with the last name of Prince are out of the same family. And um, I said, where are you from? He said, I'm, I'm from Panguitch. And uh, I said, uh, so uh, how are we, we uh, related? He said, where are you from? And I said, well, uh, my family um, is from um, New Harmony and, and St. George. And I said, uh, did you know my grandfather? Who was your grandfather? I said, uh, well, he was a sheriff in St. George, Anton Prince. And um, he hung his head down. <laughs> and looked at the floor and for a long time. And then he held his head up and he said, yeah, I knew your grandpa. And, <laughs> oh boy, I wish I hadn't asked that. <laughs> Hung his head down and looked at the floor again. Only time I was ever in jail, your grandpa put me there. <laughs> oh, great. Hung his head down again. And he looked up and he said, 12 years old, me and my buddy were in the Washington field stealing watermelons. He said, we had a whole wheelbarrow full. And he says, I guess the farmer saw us and called your grandpa. But there was two great big watermelons that we had to have. <laughs> And we went back and got those watermelons, and he said, if, if we'd have left them, I think we could have got away. <laughs> but in the time it took us to get those two watermelons, your grandpa got there, and he decided he was going to put us in jail overnight just to teach us a lesson. Yeah, I knew your grandpa. <laughs> His sense of fair play could make enemies out of, um, could make friends out of enemies, as demonstrated by Bill Shanley and to an extent Charlie Bossart. But the most unusual example occurred in a totally unexpected location. After graduating from the uh, USC School of Dentistry, my father had to go up. He was taking the Utah State Boards, and they were at the uh, the state penitentiary, and they had to work on prisoners. And um, so they, they set up all these, uh, these dentists and they brought in a line of prisoners and there was one that kept looking at dad in kind of an unusual way. And, uh, and so then the, um, uh, the chairman of the board of dental uh, examiners said, well, you boys go over and each one of you find a dentist. And this guy made a beeline to dad. And, he said, uh, your name, Prince? Yeah. Would you be related to that Sheriff Prince down in St. George? Yeah, that was my father. He's the one that sent me here. You wait here. And Dad told me, he said, I didn't know if he was going to go get a knife, get a, a razor blade, get a broken piece of glass. He said, I didn't know what he was going to do. Came back a few minutes later, and he had a, um, a tooled leather wallet and a braided horsehair belt that he handed to Dad. And um, he said uh, he treated more, me more fairly than anyone else in my life. And um, dad, dad was just stunned. Anyway, um, Anton won re-election a few times after that, but his biggest case came when um, he was called on to uh, raid the um, 
polygamous colony out at Short Creek, which is now Hilldale in Colorado City. He didn't want to do it. Um, they, uh, one, of, one of the things, he, he knew a lot of those people. And uh, there had been a few raids before that um, where he had arrested um, some of the people that he knew, and some of them were not convicted. Um, but um, the, my wife tells me I've got to cut this short. <laughs> anyway, um, that turned out to be. Um, I think what he thought was a low point in his career. He really didn't want to do it and he kind of lost his zest for um, being the sheriff. And um, let me just show you this one slide that um, the raid on the polygamists got worldwide attention. Uh, this article was taken from a magazine in Australia. To show you how well known that was. In uh, 1953, I think, it came to point where um, he was running for re-election and the county uh, uh, Democratic Party wanted him to run and he didn't want to run. And he said um, that um, He was running against, let me see, who was it? Oh, he was running against Roy Reynolds. He said, everywhere I went, I told people what a great guy Roy Reynolds was, that they should vote for him. And, um, and he lost the election by 60 votes out of about 3,500. Um, anyway, um, his reign was over, and he was relieved after he had served 18 and a half years. At that time, he was the law in Washington County, and he had become a most memorable sheriff. Epilogue. In... Um, I think 1953, my younger brother Greg was um, on a TV show in, uh, in LA. It was um, uh, the Art Linkladder House Party. I don't know whether any of you ever heard of that. And um, years later, Art Linkladder wrote a, a book called Kids Say the Darnest Things in which my brother appeared. And um, he was asked by Art Linklater um, as, as part of the, this little conversation that they had. He was only six years old. He says, is there anything that you would like to tell our television audience? And Greg said, if anybody in the world has a problem, call my grandpa. <laughs> and Linklater said, well, who's your grandpa? He's the sheriff. <laughs> End of story. So, thank you. <laughs>